Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. So very often with candidates, you hear them telling you what their platform and priorities are. And then there is that rare candidate whose actions show you what their priorities are. And our guest for today is indeed one of those candidates. Please welcome to all things LGBTQ, the Democratic candidate for governor, Brenda Siegel. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you for having me. It, it, to be here. I am so delighted that we were able to get you to come on. And I think where I would like to start is where we have begun with, with other candidates running for statewide office, which is, so what is your connection to Vermont and why was running here a priority for you? So I was born in Brattleboro, in Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. I graduated from Brattleboro Union High School. You don't often hear me talk about that because I think people are Vermonters. People are Vermonters no matter when they arrive here. Uh, but I have been a Vermonter throughout my life and my grandmother uh, has been, was a Vermonter for generations and my grandfather as uh, family immigrated here from Ukraine actually, and then um, and then also uh, from New York City is where my grandfather came from to Vermont. So we have been Vermonters for the last 45 plus years uh, in my family. And, uh, and there was a period of time when I could have left. I had a son by myself, so I was very much um, tied here to my family. And then I could have left after Tropical Storm Irene because we lost everything. And I, that's when I made the choice to stay and become a Vermonter and to fight so that people like me would have more opportunities uh, going forward. And you not only made a choice to stay here, you know, is the, and to fight is the part that I really want to talk about because you've had a degree of community involvement and organizing that many other candidates don't have, don't have that wealth of experience. Can you share some of that with the people who are watching this? Yeah, I guess I'll start from most recent and, and tell you a little bit more going forward. But I, uh, on October 14th of this past year, uh, I stood on the state house steps and said that we would not leave. I was there with someone who was actively experiencing homelessness, that we would not leave until the governor fully reinstated the a program that was emergency housing people who had been exited onto the street. And uh, what I didn't know at that time is that I would, I apologize. What I didn't know at that time is that I would be there for 27 nights. I didn't know how quickly my body and mind would deteriorate. Uh, up until that 28th day, many people thought that we could not win, but we won. It was not without hardship or a great, big, very steep uphill battle. Uh, and I think what's really important to understand is that that housing crisis was not the first crisis, nor did it begin with COVID. We have had a housing crisis looming for a very long time. Similarly, I've done work across the state and country on the overdose crisis, very successfully moving legislation. Um, but all of these issues take all of us working together fighting together. So that meant that I had to build coalitions, not just within people who agree with me automatically, but also sitting down with Republicans and Democrats that don't agree and making sure that we find a path to move forward. And so that's been the work that I've done. In, in um, March of 2018, my nephew, who I'd helped raise, died of an overdose after a year in recovery, taken down by our criminal justice system. 
And he was a son of my brother who died just over 20 years before him, also while using heroin. What my life experience tells me is that we have not done enough with 20 years between them. We still did not have the supports that they needed to be able to survive in our state. And what's really important about both housing and the overdose crisis and climate is that it's disproportionately impacting our community, the LGBTQIA community, uh, especially LGBTQIA youth. And so when we decide, when, when we do just the surface type of legislation that supports our community and don't dig deep to the things that are deeply, the ways that people are being deeply impacted and the BIPOC community is being deeply impacted, then we actually are not making the change that we mean to be making across for all of us. And I think it's something that we do have to step back and reflect. So that's been the work uh, that's been in my heart, but much of that, like you, has been uh, meeting with the governor's administration, with the administrators, uh, with trying, seeing where we could be easily shifting up just rules and policies to be able to make it a more efficient and more effective and more supportive uh, state. And the refusal to do that has been um, somewhat astounding, actually. So let's talk a little bit about some of those policies and, and some of the specific issues. Th there was a lot of publicity about the amount of American rescue dollars that came into the state of Vermont and housing being a priority. And the current administration has said that addiction is, has been a priority, access to health care. So despite all of the publicity, what did they miss? I do find that sometimes our press corps doesn't dig as deep as they could have when the administration puts out um, what they what their narrative is. And I think any of us know that that elected leaders are sometimes building a narrative around their work. And so when we're talking about the housing crisis, for example, things that had to be taken after our legislators were fighting very hard, act, actually, to make sure that there was emergency and transitional housing, to make sure that their new builds included low income folks and there was protection for tenants. All that stuff was included. Um, it had to be taken out because the governor was not going to sign the bill and the housing crisis is so bad that not moving anything forward was not an option. Additionally, um, he has repetitively vetoed things like just cause eviction and he's governing by that veto. He doesn't come to the table to work out a solution much like I've had to in legislation I've worked on. He does not come to that table and stay there until the job is done. And that means that people in Burlington were are no cause evicted with nowhere to go, no way to get back into the rental market, sometimes with severe disabilities and there being no cause evicted, in fact, because they brought up an issue that they have um, that doesn't meet ADA compliance. And, uh, but there is, no, there is no way for them to, um, to support fighting that because it was no cause. So there's many issues where he claims to care about that issue. However, when it actually um, comes to how we support those that are most impacted, we get the same kind of tri trickle down um, narratives. Like if we do this for the people at the top, then it will support the people at the bottom. But we know since the eighties and beyond that when we don't lift from the bottom to rise, then we actually aren't solving the problem at all. It doesn't help the people, it actually doesn't even help the people at the top as much as they think it is. It doesn't help the people in the middle at all. And it certainly doesn't help the people who have no recourse except the ways in which we're able to help them. And all of these issues have a connection to each other and they disproportionately impact those of us within underrepresented communities more so than others. So. Could you talk a little bit in greater detail about addiction and addiction services? And there was a very high profile veto about what could have been an option to create a safe environment for someone who was still choosing to use. So most of the people, so I, I guess I need to start by saying 
that the, this governor has presided over the most deaths in the history of our state. In 2020, we had the most increase in death from overdose of any state in the country. That means, yes, it was rising for other people, but we did worse, much worse, not by a little bit, by a lot. And then in 2021, we saw the historic amount of deaths in our state. So we had the most deaths, record-breaking number of deaths from overdose in our state. So that's where we have to start with this framing. Uh, we have a hub and spoke model that reaches three in 10 people, but there's seven in 10 who are not being reached by that model. Most people in our state are dying alone. We have seen how overdose prevention sites work, but before I even get to that, I need to say that that bill also increased access to medically assisted treatment and syringe services. Increasing access to medically assisted treatment supports recovery in a massive way. And that was also vetoed along with the rest. It also increased syringe services and syringe services not only makes it less likely for people who are actively using to get hepatitis C, but also any of their hepatitis, any or HIV, also any of their um, partners. And so it's extremely important to understand the risk that people were put under by not signing this bill. The part of the bill that the governor had took issue with was a study on overdose prevention sites. So while he and I differ, and I think that overdose prevention sites absolutely should happen, I've seen the data, the science is already there. The legislature respectfully understood that there were some concerns and went instead with a study to figure out how we could do it safely in our state. Moving forward, in a way that would save people's lives. And it doesn't just save people's lives. In the places where it has been done in this country and others, it's also decreased waste by an enormous amount because of uh, the, the reduction of needles and other paraphernalia that is in the street. It's also reduced crime by a very significant rate. And every one of these people is developing connections with someone who might be able to lead them to treatment. So if you're someone who says, we have to keep the criminal justice system because it's a link to treatment and you don't support this, then you don't mean it in the criminal justice system either. Because the criminal justice system actually causes far more harm, often death, like it did with my nephew, uh, and overdose prevention sites save lives and make that same connection in a much more safe and healthy way. People are going to use drugs. If we don't figure out how to curtail that use, to decrease the crime, the harm, by using harm reduction, we decrease use, death, and potency of the substance. When we add criminal penalties, we increase use, death, and potency of substances. That is a fact, it is not disputable. And so what the governor did was go on his drug war based ideals and not the new data and science. And if you believe in science for vaccines and you believe in science for climate, then you have to believe in science for drug policy. You either believe in science or you don't. So you also are, are truly concerned about climate change and how it impacts you know, all of the other issues. What is it that we could have done and haven't and what what is your vision to where we should be moving? Well, we can, we aren't going to solve climate change one electric vehicle at a time, and nor have we figured out how to get electric vehicles to low income people. And our state is made up of mostly moderate and low income people. So if we're not figuring that out, then I think we're we haven't at all met the mark. But additionally, we have to make sure that we're creating more in state renewable sources. We have to make sure that we're addressing how we get the solutions to low and moderate income and marginalized communities. We have to center 
in fact, those communities in our solutions. We have to support small farms in transitioning to carbon sequestration, and we have to require large farms to do their part to do that work. Um, it is not us versus them. It is that we all are going to have to take a heavy lift right now if we want it. Um, if we want to support a reversal, I mean, I don't even know that we can support a reversal. If we want to move forward on protecting our earth for for our children and for the earth. Thank you. It, and I want to switch a little bit. You are unique in the the typical candidate who runs for public office. I'm wondering if you could share some thoughts about what it is that we do that makes it difficult for people to run for public office and what it is that would specifically need to change to support people running for public office. The first thing that I wanna say about that is that if we want marginalized people to be in leadership, then we're gonna to have to redefine what we see as um, people developing their leadership skills. Because it is not a reality that people like me, low-income single mom, can climb the unpaid ladder or the low-paid ladder, uh, leaving their kids at home. I did not have another parent in order to get to um, running for a statewide office. We have to accept that we see leaders in our communities every single day who are perfectly capable, who are already the bench to make this to make this work. And we need people who already have this power to be lifting those folks as well. I also want to say that the financial barrier is designed on purpose to keep low income people out of office in all levels of office. And I'm in a position where I'm the Democratic nominee. It's kind of phenomenal. I'm the Democratic nominee. I'm still low income. I'm still struggling. And, I'm, and, I've, and I've made it to this moment by really fighting and giving a lot of myself, but without the support and help of others, uh, economically, we're, gonna have, we're not gonna be able to uh, wage the same fight. And frankly, I can wage quite a fight. So if people support, I am able to do that work. However, this is not what should be happening. We should have a public finance system so that th all that we're looking at is, is this a good candidate for office? Is this someone who can really lead our state forward? If that was our only question, then there are several people, I would say, who are obvious choices to be in leadership roles. But as long as we accept that money is the only thing that qualifies you, really, because we don't ask someone if they're a businessman of many years, what, what else they've done. We just don't, or if they're a billionaire, not to name names. We don't, we just don't. But we do ask, especially women, especially LGBTQ communities, especially black and brown folks, we do ask them, and oftentimes based on stigma around their poverty. And I would guess that most folks who have fought hard lives full of trauma are actually so much more prepared to lead us forward because they have had to dig their heels in and keep clawing their way to survival in ways that most of us cannot even imagine. So, in our remaining time, what's the question I didn't ask you? Okay, I guess on Friday, we saw our the civil liberties across the state, across the country, by the Supreme Court, begin to erode in a massive way. Uh, the reversal of Roe v. Wade is going to make many of our neighbors, many other people across the country currently um, lose their rights. We have a reproductive uh, health, reproductive freedom amendment for our constitution, which we can all vote, Proposition 5, we can all vote for the reproductive liberty amendment in November. However, 
if you hear people telling you that we are safe here and that's enough, it is not enough. It's first of all, only the tip of the iceberg. Next is gonna be contraception. Also, marriage equality. And I would not stop there. It's going to go on and on and on if we are not prepared to fight back and prepared to protect people. So the things that we need to do in addition to Prop 5 is we need to first of all say that we will not extradite people who come here to have a safe and legal abortion. We, are, we cannot extradite people with reproductive organs who access that care here. We need to build up a fund so that that care does not show up on their insurance, so that it cannot be found so that they can do it in private. We need to ensure that we are leading about Prop 5, not just saying, well, we're done. Like we did it, we did what we need to. And in addition to all of that, if there is a federal ban, we are not protected by Prop 5. So we need to make sure that we're fighting to ensure that there won't be a federal ban and coming up with and coming up with agreement for protections across the state that uh, would protect us even then. And that is a, that's a tough call to make, but it's one that we have to make because we cannot backslide all of the civil liberties that were won. At one time, it was legal to restrict those liberties from people and it is starting to be again. And if we don't say we will not accept that under any circumstance, we will block it, then we are not leading on this issue. So I would say that we need to lead. And with that, I need to say thank you. And I'm looking forward to standing next to you in the work that's before us. Thank you. Thank you so much. On a recent episode of All Things LGBTQ, I shared information that I had read from a newsletter from Equality Maine that talked about their Republican Party and the platform they had just adopted. But I also received notice, and we have reported on, Equality Maine has a new executive director, and we thought this might be a good time to introduce that new executive director and talk about what is happening in Maine inequality. So please welcome to all things LGBTQ for the first, but hopefully not the last time, Gia Drew, welcome. Hey, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here, Keith. Thank you for the invitation. I, I am so glad we could find time for this conversation. So it's been a while since All Things LGBTQ has really focused on Equality Maine and its role within our larger communities. Could, could we start with you sharing a little bit about the work that Equality is, Maine is doing and then we'll start talking about how you became involved with okay. them. We can do that. Sure. So for folks who are unfamiliar with Equality Maine, uh, we were founded in 1984 uh, after the murder of a young man named Charlie Howard, a young gay, gay man who was living in Bangor and was uh, thrown off a bridge and was killed for being gay. And uh, for those of you familiar with Stephen King and his novels, that of course that scene was captured in the novel It and featured in the movies as well. As you know, Stephen King lives in Bangor. He was deeply affected by that tragedy in the 80s. Uh, of course, not only Stephen King, but concerned community members in Bangor and around the, the state and the country actually reacted um, against the murder of Charlie. And in the aftermath of that, uh, a community group was formed known then as the Maine Lesbian Gay Political Alliance, the MLGPA to provide education on how great it is to be LGBTQ um, to form a community so people could connect with one another in a large rural state like Maine and to advocate for policies and laws to protect LGBTQ people. And, and that little organization 38 years ago, it 
morphed into Equality Maine, which is where we are today. Uh, and we still do those things. Absolutely. We are still, you know, talking about what it means to be LGBTQ out into the world. Uh, we do a lot of education um, with corporations, small businesses, social service agencies, state agencies around what it means to be LGBTQ, how to make workplaces more inclusive, how schools can be doing a better job. So that's still at the core of what we do. We definitely do community events across the state to bring people together. Uh, and we support other community organizations doing like-minded work. So we don't have to do all that ourselves. Um, and we, of course, are, are still doing the public policy work uh, that is so important to ensure that LGBTQ people uh, can live their lives free from discrimination. Uh, and so that's, that is an ongoing ongoing effort at Equality Maine. So the, the mission of the, and the work it really has stayed pretty consistent in 38 years. Of course, it's evolved and changed over time. Um, but I mean, that is at the core of who we are at Equality Maine. And, and in a little bit, we will talk about what you're anticipating with this most, with this election season and mm -hmm. when your legislature convenes. But if we could talk, or if you would be willing to share a little bit about how you happen to come to Maine and how you happen to become involved with Equality Maine. And I understand that you were a first in several areas. <laughs> uh, sure. I'd like to say it all started in Vermont. Um, it didn't exactly, but I do have a, a Vermont history. So I just want to put that out there. Um, I was married in Concord, Vermont in 1994 in uh, the Northeast Kingdom region of Vermont and lived in the St. Johnsbury area and then moved to Southern Vermont and lived in Brattleboro for a little while. And uh, I was a, a school teacher, a public school teacher for much of my career for 20 years. Some of that in Vermont and New Hampshire and eventually landed here in Maine about a little over 22 years ago. Um, and during that time as a teacher here in Maine, I transitioned on the job, becoming one of the first out transgender teacher, public school teachers here in Maine, and one of the first out transgender high school coaches in the entire country. And uh, absolutely didn't plan to be first or want to be first. It just happened that way. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a lot of challenges in doing that, as you may imagine. This wasn't very long ago. This was about 13 years ago that this was all happening here in Maine. And my school was not ready for that, nor was most public schools ready to have an out transgender teacher or coach. And so it could have gone better, unfortunately. And I was pushed out of teaching uh, about a year into that. And I became unemployed and virtually unemployable as an out transgender teacher here in the state of Maine. And that's really where my connection to Equality Maine started. And that was in 2012. And it was there I started volunteering on the marriage campaign in 2012 uh, with Equality Maine and uh, was a volunteer for about a year and a half and then was hired in 2014 to do programming, rural outreach and work in schools. And, uh, and here I am today, uh, 10 years later, I've risen up from a volunteer to become the executive director of Equality Maine. That's, that's quite the wealth of experience. So my next question may seem a sort of duh. <laughs> so what made Gia the best pick to be the executive director at Equality Maine at this point in time? Well, that's a it's a fair question. And so the board directors did do a national search to make sure they were getting the best candidate possible to lead the organization for the next, you know, for the foreseeable future. And, uh, and that's good on them to do that. Um, I think they wanted to be sure that they had someone that had a vision um, for the organization in our community that aligned with their, their goals and strategic planning and, um, and I'm glad they picked me. Uh, but I, I, I think the things I bring to this work that maybe 
are different than our maybe our previous directors. And you know, we, there's not a lot. We've only had a handful of directors um, run the organization over those 38 years. For much of it, it really was a volunteer-driven organization, and it really wasn't a staffed organization until the you know the mid 2000s when we started doing non-discrimination protections. And so, um, I think for me, what what I think makes me a standout candidate was. Um, the longevity, of course, in the connection to the community here in Maine and my ties and grassroots ties to, to Mainers, you know, getting to know Maine first as a teacher for, for a, such a long time and coach, knowing the communities across Maine, um, and then having done the outreach and community work for the last nine years, um, working with, with different community members, young and old, in virtually every county in the state, um, and my relationships that I built along the way. I think are a really important part of being executive director is is maintaining and establishing relationships with people and with organizations and and utilizing those relationships to effective create change. So I think that that was a one of the reasons. Um, I'd like to think that I'm a, an inclusive leader that I, I really appreciate divergent points of view and creative thinking and and maybe not always doing what we once did, you know, and I think the idea that I am a, a trendsetter, uh, willing to challenge the norm. Uh, I am the first out trans person to run the state organization. You know, I think there are some, some visibility issues that I, I like to think having a transgender person lead the organization is exactly where we should be. Uh, at this day and age in terms of where most of our conversations are happening on LGBTQ rights. We are mostly talking about what it means to be trans or non-binary binary in this world. And I think just my lived experience related to being trans and, and uh, my familiarity with gender issues and, and things like that. And then just the work I've done coordinating and programs here at Equality Maine. We run a lot of youth programs. I oversee all our programs for older adults through Sage Maine and all our education. You know, so I think I'm the candidate that they chose for all those reasons. Um, and uh, I'm excited. It's exciting to sort of take on this challenge. It's not easy running a business or an organization uh, that has such a long storied history. And we have a state that has nearly a you know, 100,000 LGBTQ people in it. And so that's a deep, that's a really weighing responsibility too. And I think uh, they chose someone who is mature and has handled uh, responsibility before, has weathered challenges personal and, you know, challenges before and has risen above them. And so I think, I do think they made a good decision. <laughs> From what I have heard, I, I would tend to agree. And I would, support the national search because we received notice and included it on our news program encouraging people yeah. to apply. So what is your vision as the new executive director for the priorities for Equality Maine and how would you like to move the organization forward? Well, it's interesting. We did a strategic plan in 2013, and then we did sort of a mini one about four years ago. And then we are in the process of finalizing a new strategic plan. Um, and it hasn't changed all that much. But I, I will say the things where we're really pivoting most urgently are the needs and concerns of the most marginalized members of our community. Um, and, and historically, they, they may not have been the focus of attention at Equality Maine. And that's something that I own as now the director that I inherit that history. Um, and we still know that there are LGBTQ people out there, especially who are poor, living with a disability, maybe they're black indigenous or person of color, or maybe English is not their first language. Um, and I think for me, um, in speaking with the hiring committee and the board is that's really where I think we should be spending the bulk of our energy and time is to how do we empower and lift up um, the most marginalized among us. Um, so I, I think that's where I'm leading from. 
in the work that we're going to be doing in the in the in the future, and that's going to take time and effort. It it, it takes communication with our traditional base. You know, our base that's been connected to Equality Maine is now older. They're white. They're mostly cisgender. And so how do we communicate with that group of people who are still very important about our priorities are still making sure we have laws and policies that protect people. We have programs that connect people to one another and we don't wanna leave anybody behind. We wanna make sure that everyone you know, can live their life free from discrimination and can thrive in every, every community in Maine. Maine is a very big state and so our offices are here in Portland, which is a pretty welcoming place to be LGBTQ, but there are other pockets in Maine that it's pretty hostile still if you have a pride flag in front of your house. You're probably going to get yelled at or get some, you know, some slurs hurled at you by some people driving by. Um, or you're going to be at a school board meeting where people are going to say really horrible things about you. And so, you know, I want to make sure that we're prioritizing the needs of the most marginalized, the folks in rural Maine. Um, and keeping our eye on the prize in terms of public policy and law. So building off the public policy and law, this is an election year. Yeah. And the newsletter that I had received from Equality Maine talked about the Maine Republican Party having adopted a strongly worded anti-LGBTQ plus platform. So taking that into consideration, what is the political climate like in Maine right now? What are you anticipating? Mm -hmm. And do you think that the Maine Republican Party will try to introduce hostile pieces of legislation? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I can say that, I can say that with a smile, but it's terrifying. And so I think, as you, as folks have seen across the country, there is a wave of anti-LGBTQ sentiment, uh, sediment, sediment, whatever that word is, sentiment, sentiment, not sediment. <laughs> um, and it's ugly and it's rooted in all sorts of stuff that I don't wanna get into, but, uh, and we do expect that to show up on our shores here in Maine uh, in the next legislative cycle, which begins in January. You know, we got a hint of it in our last legislative cycle, there were three or four squarely anti-trans bills that were introduced about transgender participation in sports, uh, allowing shelters to turn away transgender women from, from women's shelters and things like that. And we just know that, and all those bills were written exactly like all the other bills in other states. And so we know there's a coordinated effort across the country to attack LGBTQ people, to remove LGBTQ people, especially transgender people from public life. And so we expect that to happen. Um, but for us to be prepared to fight that fight, we need to have pro-equality candidates elected in office here in, in, the, in Maine, in the State House specifically. Uh, and we've been doing a really good job ensuring that our Maine legislature is pro-equality. And we have a pro-equality Senate, we have a pro-equality House of Representatives, and we have a governor that is a strong ally to LGBTQ people. And she has signed numerous LGBTQ bills, Governor Mills. And so, you know, we're gonna do our best over the next five months to ensure that we maintain uh, the House and Senate in terms of pro-equality candidates. Uh, we do have an endorsement process that goes on this summer. And so there'll be like a, a questionnaire and scorecard for elected officials, and then we'll be endorsing candidates in the races for a state legislature. Um, we've already endorsed Governor Mills for a second term. And so uh, I think that is really important. And we're, of course, supportive of Shelley Pingree, one of our, our Congress members. And we have a very close race with um, our, our Congressman Jared Golden, who represents our second district. It's a very purple district, and he's going to probably be in a very close race. If you remember, he actually lost the, 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 the popular vote in the last election, but won because of ranked choice voting. And so we know that that election is going to be very tight uh, for that district, and that is really important for our federal, federal protections. Um, and the race for governor is neck and neck. Um, 
the latest polling has Governor Mills and, and LePage in a virtual dead heat if you factor in that, you know, you know, the margin of error. And so I think that is terrifying, absolutely terrifying to consider that the former governor is even close to Governor Mills at this point in time. Um, he's horribly anti-LGBTQ. Uh, when he was governor for eight years, he did nothing uh, to protect LGBTQ. He went out of his way to like do things that were anti-LGBTQ and still and like signing on for things in other states that had nothing to do with Maine. He just wanted to put his name on being anti-LGBTQ. He would use anti-LGBTQ slurs when he talked to elected officials. He called parents that support transgender kids like horrible things. And so, yeah, we, we do not need um, a governor that wants to roll back same-sex marriage, wants to stop any conversations of being LGBTQ in schools or anything like that. And, and, and again, we know he's, you know, anti, anti-abortion as well. And so, you know, we have no energy to bring that person back into the state house and we're gonna do whatever we can um, to elect pro quality candidates and that includes Governor Mills again. So is there a sense in Maine that either your Senate or your House might flip? Or are people feeling fairly confident that those majorities will be maintained? That's a good question. You know, I haven't heard recently. I think there was some early on uh, worries about this. Maybe the Senate would be the only one because we did have, it did switch recently in the last couple of cycles. It did switch from Republican to Dem and it has switched back and forth, but it, there's never been a super majority uh, either way. We definitely will keep the House. It looks like we'll keep the House. I mean, everything got redistricted as it did everywhere in the country after the census. And so it's hard really to know exactly what's going to happen next. Because uh, some of the districts for some of the Senate seats are just completely new. Like, I have no idea uh, what's happening in some of them. So I'd like to think we're going to keep the a progressive majority in the House and Senate. Uh, so should there be that catastrophe of, of the other governor coming back, we'd have the that sort of barrier protecting us against, you know, that that horrible thought. But hopefully we'll get we'll keep everything. That would be nice. So with that, I need to say thank you for spending this time with us. And I'm extending an invitation now that post-election, we get back together and talk about what just happened in your backyard. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. You are welcome. Have a great day. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.